guests all tonight. Uh, my name is Adina Glickman. I'm the founding director of the Stanford Resilience Project. Uh, the project was launched in 2011 as a resource that uses personal narratives, programming, and academic skills coaching to motivate and support students as you experience academic setbacks. We emphasize the importance of failure as a normal part of the learning process, and we seek to instill a sense of belonging and bravery as you encounter the the normal setbacks that come with a rigorous education. We believe failure is not something to be avoided at all costs, but rather something essential to a rich education. In recent years, much research has emerged around the concepts of grit and, and persistence in college students. And a lot of people conflate these terms, grit, resilience, persistence, perseverance. But we want to illuminate an important distinction. When we named the Resilience Project, it was with a conscious intent to steer the conversation away from valuing individual traits like grit and perseverance to our recognition of a contextual relationship between the individual and the institution. The Resilience Project supports the notion that a student's ability to grow her resilience has something to do with our ability as an institution to support or get in the way of that growth. One way Stanford hopes to support your efforts to grow your resilience is by presenting events like this. By inviting our beloved and respected scholars, teachers, and leaders to share the stories of their setbacks and the growth of their resilience, we hope to normalize failure and frame what we learn from these setbacks. I am honored to share the stage with these um, amazing people. Unfortunately, Joanne Sanders was not able to join us today. Tonight she had a family matter she had to attend to, but I'm delighted that our three panelists are here with us. I'm going to introduce them, and I want you to pay close attention to the uh, traditional accomplishment-laden descriptions that I will give you. After I introduce them, you will get to hear an alternate version of their resumes. To my left is Professor Martha Seyert. She received her AB from Harvard in 1980 and went on to receive her PhD in genetics from UCSF in 1988. After completing her postdoctoral fellowship in biochemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, in 1992, she joined the Stanford faculty where she is now a professor of biology and a Thomas W. and Susan B. Ford University fellow in undergraduate education. From 2010 to 13, she served as the senior associate vice provost in undergraduate education, and in that job worked to establish the Leland Scholars Program. Dr. Sire is a recipient of the Dean's Award for outstanding teaching and has also taught cell biology workshops in West Africa. She currently directs an NIH-funded graduate training program in cell and molecular biology and is a member of the Stanford Cardiovascular and BioX Institutes. Dr. Sire also serves on the Public Affairs Advisory Council for the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Her research focuses on understanding signaling pathways in humans that are targeted by immunosuppressant drugs, FK506, and cyclosporine A that are given to organ transplant patients. Welcome. Good job. <laughs> this is Professor Ray McDermott. He is a professor of education at the Graduate School of Education and, by courtesy, Cultural and Social Anthropology. He received his BA in Philosophy and Chinese from Queens College and his PhD in Anthropology from Stanford University in 1977. His early career began as an elementary school teacher in the New York City public school system from 1968 to 70. Ray was an assistant professor in the Laboratory of Comparative Human Cognition at Rockefeller University from 1975 to 79, and was, was an associate and then full professor at Teachers College at Columbia University until 1989, when he returned to Stanford as a professor at the GSE. Much of his current research has been centered on the intersection of education, social structure, and political economy. He takes a broad interest in the analysis of human communication, the organization of school success and failure, and the history and use of various literacies around the world. His work includes studies of inner city public schools, after school classrooms, and the function of information technologies in different cultures. In 2013, Ray was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association for Educational Research. Welcome, Ray. Huh? <laughs> That's you. That was me? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> Finally, we have <laughs> Professor Maran Sahami, who is Professor and Associate Chair for Education in the Computer Science Department and the Robert and Ruth Halpern University Fellow in Undergraduate Education at Stanford. 
Neuron received all of his degrees from Stanford, first his Bachelor of Science with Distinction in Computer Science in 1992, his Master's in Science in 1993, and his PhD in Computer Science with a Distinction in Teaching in 1999. After graduating, he became the Senior Engineer Manager engineering manager at Epiphany Inc. and then in 2002 joined Google as a senior research scientist, which he eventually gave up to become an associate and then full professor at Stanford. In 2012, he was named one of the best 300 professors in the nation by Princeton Review and was the invited speaker for Stanford's graduating class of 2013. In 2014, he received the ACM Presidential Award and co-founded the ACM Conference on Learning at Scale which is now an annual meeting on interdisciplinary research at the intersection of the learning sciences and computer science. Marin has published over 50 technical papers and has over 20 patents. Some of them pending, I'm not sure. Huh? We can ask the USPTO. We'll, we'll, we'll check. So, as you might imagine, these wonderful biographies filled with achievements and successes are only part of the true experiences that that these fine folks have had and that we really all have. I'm now going to ask each of our panelists to reintroduce themselves using their failure resumes. <laughs> so um, first I just wanted to thank Adina very much for putting together this uh, great event and for inviting me probably for the first time to speak about something that I feel like I really am very good at <laughs> and very familiar with. So uh, I don't have to fake it at all in terms of talking about failure. And uh, I, I thought that I there's so many different uh, anecdotes to choose from. I thought I would just focus on a couple, one at the beginning of my career and one at the end of the career. So, uh, well not the end because it's not over yet. It's not over recent. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to say was that anyone out there who is an experimental scientist of any kind, I think being an experimental scientist is the very best training of all in failure because the whole scientific process is about failing and you have to basically fail as a intermediate to being able to succeed. So most of the experiments you do in the lab will fail, everyone knows that, but the key is to have them fail in such a way that it gives you critical information so you can figure out why it failed, how it failed, and then go into your next iteration and make it better. And then that one will fail in a different way. But again, if you've set the experiment up correctly, you can try to figure out what went wrong that time and so on. So it's really that whole pro process of troubleshooting is science. And the times that you come in and do an experiment and it works and you get the result are like tiny compared to all the times that you go in there and they don't work. So that teaches you a bit, at least at the professional level, that uh, to expect, not to expect things to work every time, but also to really try to learn as much as you can from things that don't work. So I'd say I uh, ran into that and, and really learned that lesson up close and personal. At the very beginning of my career, I was a graduate student at UCSF. My graduate advisor, Mark Kirshner, is super famous. He was really famous then. I was in a lab full of people that are really successful and to this day, probably way more successful than I am. I had a great project. The goal of the project, I don't want to go into all the science stuff, but basically the goal of the project was to try to purify uh, something that was a biological activity, but we didn't really know what the proteins were. So I ended up being a graduate student for six and a half years, and I'd say probably about five years of that time I spent trying and trying and trying to purify this, this activity. Uh, it was very labile, meaning every time I tried to purify it, it would eventually disappear. We tried lots of different uh, uh, angles and, and different strategies to try to purify it. And probably the hardest thing was the day that I just finally decided, you know what, this is just it. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> it's, it's not working. I don't know why it's not working, but it's not going to work. And uh, that was difficult, and it was definitely difficult to sort of stand up to my advisor and say, this is the time. It's time for both of us to move on. 
Uh, and I actually had a chance to talk to him about that uh, just this past summer. I said, you know, now I have students and I, I kind of think back on, you know, my not purifying that and I was thinking, you must have been very disappointed. And he said, oh no. <laughs> so that was cool. Uh, but then really the best part about making that decision and accepting the failure was that then it really gave me a chance to use all the things I'd learned along the way from those failures to basically now design a new project. And that new project was successful and it took me basically a year of doing those experiments to get all the results that went into my PhD and my publications from my, my graduate work. So that's just a very explicit case where the failures really were teaching me the things I needed to then create my own ideas and go in a different direction and have success. So the, the failure was a required part of that later success. And then the other uh, part of my resume in terms of failure that I wanted to jump to is something that happened really just recently. And I wanted to make the point that, you know, probably a lot of people think, oh, you know, Stanford professor, biology, that person's just super successful. Uh, but, you know, at any point in your career, you have bumps in the road. It happens to everyone. And what happened to me was uh, I had a grant from the National Institutes of Health that had funded the research in my lab. I came here in 1992. I got the grant then, and every four years wrote a renewal, which was funded and continued the research in the lab. And then uh, three years ago, two years ago, the grant didn't get funded. And this is all the funding for my lab, so that was pretty horrible. Uh, and you actually get two choices, chances at NIH, so you get the review comments back, which I didn't really think were so great, and, uh, <laughs> but you get a chance to try to address them and rewrite the grant and get a few more results and put it in again, and it didn't get funded the second time. So this is a case where I really had to face probably what was you know, the worst thing I could possibly imagine happening to me. And uh, I can talk about it now, I think, very easily because I came out the other side. So again, it was a chance to, uh, first of all, ask for help. I had financial help from the school. Uh, it was a chance to retool and take my research in a new direction, which I then got funding for. and. Uh, Actually, I'm way happier with the directions that the research is going right now. But uh, on really the most serious note, I want to say that that feeling uh, of failure, uh, that was something that hit very close to home. And I think what it really brings home to me is that there's a sense of shame that comes with failure. Very personal. You just you feel so ashamed. And uh, to me, what actually made it feel better was when I started talking to people about it. And it was happening to a lot of people. The funding has gotten very tight. Uh, but still, it's something you don't really want to admit. And you start talking to people about it and making plans and figuring out what you're going to do to get through this rough patch. And you know, I really believe some of those things that people say, what's, what's that expression about when the going gets tough, the tough get going? Everyone faces failure. Everyone faces ch challenges and difficulties. I think what really is the mark of who you are as a person is how you face those challenges and uh, move forward. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm supposed to talk about failure. Um, I don't know. I Someone one day I get a call and said, will you please come and talk about the failures? And I'd say, well, you've come to the right place. I'm the king of failures. This is my court. And listen to me if you want to know about failure. Um, yeah, I have some illusions of success around um, people make mistakes. <laughs> so I want to talk about three things. And the first is um, little failures. And uh, give it up, don't sweat, just keep going. Well, my day is a series of them. And on the way here, it was a dark 
spot and I, in a little construction, I had to go a new way and I walked through mud and and then I come in and you know, there's something you notice I came up here and both in the bottle and the water went all over my pants, <laughs> which means I couldn't write down the last three notes that I wanted to put on the thing. So, but like, so those are ridiculous problems compared to like getting a C or D on your test and stuff. But yeah, uh, no, hardly, unless, until you, unless you apply to grad school, nobody's ever going to see that transcript. But that's not even it. It's that it shouldn't be bothering you all that much. There are dumb tests given all the time. There are people who know more than the test can reveal. There, are, and sometimes it's just well, there's a mess that's there for you. Um, but very occasionally, and you got to look to see if there's an important message. But mostly, the little stuff, give it up, back off. You're not that important anyway. Find something else to think about. The second one is uh, is the the thing that in my life. Uh, I've um, I'm thinking a lot about, and I've been an absolute failure. If I stated all my goals 40 years ago, none of them have come out, um, and um, it's okay. I, I've gotten used to it. Uh, some, I've stored some ideas away, so I'll talk about that a little bit. And then thirdly, I want to talk about, just as if I was a senior in college, um, I'm facing a new phase of life. It, am I going to retire? Am I not going to retire? This is very heavy decision because it's one of the ones you don't get to change your mind about very much, right? So it really moves a lot of things around. So that's the one, two, three bit. Okay? Everybody got it? Okay, the little ones. The constant tests, the appraisals, the competitive put-downs, the crushed identities. Why am I the only one who can't get this? Don't sweat it. Back off. The little bumps. Now especially for um, Stanford students. And me, when I was failing out of college in my first year, um, I, I was failing so naturally. Um, I had so many other things to do. It was really quite all right. And I learned how not to worry. In fact, if I worried a whole lot about failure at that time, I would probably just be returning to school to see if I could finish my BA. All right? <laughs> C minus is not good for my first year. Okay. Um, so, so in addition to your mental health and your happiness, um, there's another reason to not sweat the daily grind, but it's an arrogant reason. Uh, the arrogant reason is the Stanford University train only stops at the stations that offer success of one kind or another. Whatever you did to get in here, yeah, here, let's say GAR. Hmm. Um, whatever you did to get in here is more than enough. Even in a nasty competitive society, you probably have all that you need. So. What you should do is forget about yourself and worry about all the people who didn't get in. When I talk to Stanford students, they say, well, who are the most important people for bringing you here? Most of them say their parents pay tuition and it's all important stuff. Nobody ever mentions that for every one person who gets in there, what a horrible, horrible number, like another uh, 10 who don't get in. I mean, it, it's like nobody knows who they are. You've crushed their life. You should maybe do guilt instead of fear. <laughs> that would be much better. So, um, not to mention the people who didn't know they should apply, or the flat out people who never heard of Stanford University. Right? And that's the great bulk of the country. You know, Stanford's because of food. I, uh, I take most of the little stuff pretty unseriously. There was one, I guess I should tell you, but I took very seriously. I wanted for some reason to become a translator. When I was 19, I decided I wanted to translate old Chinese religious texts into English. I took the first year of Chinese, and that went pretty well. They gave me a scholarship to go to, to uh, intense Chinese. And about eight weeks into that horrible summer, um, I was the worst student when I walked in, and every day the distance between me and the rest of the class continued to, to grow. <laughs> And in the eighth week, my teacher suggested that I get a hearing test. <laughs> this is not a good sign for a language learner. And deep down deep, I knew that I could learn Chinese, because all the Chinese people do it. So. <laughs> and if I was the worst student in the class, after two intense years of Chinese, and, and I, was, I would get there, and I would have more than enough to build on, I'd come back in charge of Chinese. But it just seemed like it wasn't the right line for me. 
it was always going to be harder than it should be. And if I really, really wanted to, there was nothing else I wanted. I would, could have done that, I guess. But it was one of the times when I backed off. Two years later, I got a job teaching in New York City kids, African-American kids in a bottom school, in the bottom neighborhood. I actually had grown up in that neighborhood. In the, the, I was in, <laughs> met the kids in the schoolyard where I used to play, uh, some of you know about stickball, uh, uh, just a, not a bat but a broom hand. And, um, and it was a hard, hard job. But the, the more I was there, the more I realized the kids are wonderful and school is not so nice. And all the bad experiences I had in school, all of a sudden, uh, I realized I was right to not like them so much, but there was nothing compared to what these kids were getting. I went to a Catholic school about a half mile away. You know, we didn't, we didn't, I didn't get out of my seat for eight years. I think we had gym once. And uh, <laughs> the first two years, we were allowed to go to the bathroom once a day. Right? I was, I sat, sit there, like, you know, tied up in a straight jacket. The crazy thing you do to children. Um, and, you know, a little violence, and uh, it was awful. And I, I said, um, it's okay, if I, uh, if I don't learn Chinese, I now know. When I hit, when I hit that glass, it was like a duck getting on water. I really liked the kids. I really wanted to help. I had to find the right place for me to help as many of them as possible. So I went into anthropology because I love it, and then I used anthropology to study kids in schools and turned that into a, into a life. And 40 years later, it's, it's the big thing right? that, that is my whole life. 40 years later, really hard work, and every year it's gotten worse. The things I want to fix are not available for the fixing, and for the next four years it's going to be that much worse. I mean, if I lined up all my, all my, and I think well-informed and carefully thought out programs of what should happen to American education, and I look what, what's coming down the line, that's been coming down the line for the last 37 years, but now it's gonna really get much worse. Yeah, so I'm not in the corner crying. And it isn't because I have grit or perseverance, and it might be a little bit because I'm kind of dull-witted and just real slow to figure out that, that I've lost, is that there's a deeper hope that democracy is going to work and it's going to go back into the schools and schools are going to do the right kinds of things for kids and communities that they should have been doing all along and we have lots of great examples of it from here and there in the world and in the United States there's always a thousand schools doing something wonderful. So I've become something of an Irish monk ninth century Irish monk writing, copying Aristotle into a book on the chance that civilization will come back. Right? And it's not what I hoped for, um, but you know, that was real hard to get, to hold on to the ideas that I want to hold on to, that I want others to hold on to. I've been able to hold on to them, I've been able to win the arguments, I've been able to write the stuff I want to write, and some occasionally people pay attention, and they don't know what to do either, it's, it's keeping alive a hope and, um, and winning is just not the issue, at least not now. But engaging the failure, rolling down the hill with it. Make sure when, you don't, when you're worried about yourself, make sure you get a something that's more important that you are, that, you, that it isn't that you can't afford to fail at it, the world cannot afford to let you fail at it. Okay. That's a difference. So that's the real challenge. Um, now it's only you know, so Chinese is one, and well, my life's work is the other. Um, it's, it's but I also found out along the way is that failure is what Americans do. We do not send children to school to learn to read and write. We send to ch our children to school to learn to read and write better than their neighbors. All we care about is how the kids are doing. I sent my kids to a totally progressive school in New York. She moment a report card. It's one to five. It says ethic, mar ethic marks. Oh, what's an ethic mark? She says, it's about how hard we're trying. Now, all of a sudden, as a parent who wants to guide the kid to the next generation, I'm going to worry about what it means that she has a two in math. 
because that's at one end, and four is at the other. So uh, I, I don't want to ask too directly, you know, and I'm talking to her about kids and math. And I was carrying in, oh, she's great at math, Dad. What did she get? So one, okay, two, we're all right. I don't have to get a, a therapist or uh, a tutor or anything. This is the fourth grade. But I'm doing what American parents do. We can't let our kids fall too far behind. But in fact, and that's what we got a thing called the achievement gap. All that means is that Americans are focusing on how much difference there is between two people. If you quickly made everybody almost alike, the Educational Testing Service in New Jersey would go from the billion dollar industry to a quadruple trillion dollar industry because they'd have to get fine and green tests because everybody has to know who is ahead and who is behind. Okay? And you know, 70 years old, I went to the American Anthropological Association last week. I spent like, a whole half the night up. Um, all I'm doing is commenting on somebody else's paper. I know, but it's another intelligence display. It is who I am for a whole lot of people. I don't want to mess it up. And I certainly don't want to say, yeah, he used to be good. Now he's an old fart. And what can you do? Right? <laughs> so it's, it's always somebody ready to take it down. There are educational systems without that problem. And then I suppose I have a much nicer educational system, and I suspect a whole lot of people get a lot more done when they don't have to spend all their time arranging, not, be, not getting caught, not knowing something. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you spend your time just learning stuff and cooperating with those around you and solving problems that count right, instead of most of the stuff that we get in school. So, uh, it's in that spirit that I say, uh, get yourself a really good problem to fail at or succeed at, and it won't make any difference to you which way it goes, because the journey will have been more than good enough. So the third problem, um, what am I going to do if I'm not a professor? I mean. I dress the way I dress. One time I you know, hailed a cab, the guy I get in, the guy in New York, wise ass, and he says, well, what university are you going to? That <laughs> <laughs> um, was not as good in the day as when I was going to my William Butler Yates phase and I jumped in a car with my Irish cap and a scarf around my neck. And he said, uh, Irish poet? <laughs> <laughs> so my next new engagement is uh, really kind of daunting. Because failure can be so nasty, a lot of people just die. They don't know who they are. You know? uh, if I want to meet most of the Stanford faculty, I look to the Stanford at the uh, uh, San Francisco airport, walk around, and I'll be running through, getting their planes, going here, there. If I want to meet the retired faculty, I'll go over to Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and I meet everybody. They probably should have a little lunch table there, just for Stanford professors. You know, that would be a large table. Like, this is not what I want to do. But what else am I? I could go to China and learn Chinese. We got Tao Chung Luo Chu. I said it. It didn't all go away. All those, all those years of studying Chinese, I got a little bit left. Maybe I could build on that. I'm not sure who I talked to. <laughs> it's a little bit out of my range. My grandchildren would be Fa Fa. You know Fa Fa? Fa Fa. It's F A R. I have a New York accent. F A R F A R. I didn't learn English too well either. Far, far. Okay. Um, well, I could call them on the phone. Yeah. I could teach them how to count in Chinese. I'm not sure. This is, um, this is not good. Then there's the money stuff. The economy dries up. All of a sudden, I've never seen this happen. Just in downturn, 2009, professors had just retired, and all of a sudden, half this stuff is gone. Right? What do you do then? Where do you go to get a new job? Where do you show up back? Um, that would be tough. Uh, one or two illnesses can wipe out a whole family full of, uh, of uh, savings. And then I can't remember being forgotten. Uh, the people are infinitely better. I won't say smarter. That's an American education where it's uninteresting. Um, yeah. Get out of here. It's for those who conform well enough to the kinds of tests that Americans give each other that they know what to do. Um, I, I take 
I take no uh, interest in it. Um, there are people infinitely more accomplished than I am. Maybe I could say that. There are people who seem to know a whole lot more than I do or get paid attention. Could I give all that up? I mean, they, they get forgotten within two weeks. The students come in the next September and they say, who is he? What are you talking about? Oh, he used to teach here. Uh, <laughs> right? I want to, I, I mean, I can find myself kind of climbing up the walls of cover and jumping in. Um, so, um, it's a tough one, right? And, you know, life is tough. Um, but it's also extremely interesting. That's what I want to do. I want to throw myself into retirement and say, here I am. Give me, give me what you got, and I'll work with it. And then, if I fail or exceed, eh, doesn't make all that much difference. So embrace your failure. It's a sign that you're not boring. And um, <laughs> take, uh, take on the things you won't win, but you're willing to try and try. Yeah, that's more interesting than mine. I've already failed. <laughs> that's tough. Going after it in a number of ways. Um, so I'm so afraid of failing that I had to do as I was told. And so when Adina said, you make a failure resume, I was like, yes, ma'am. I'm making a failure resume. I'm not failing at this. <laughs> so I went chronologically, and I thought about, you know, when I look back, um, what were some of the, the big deal failures? Um, and the first one was uh, in fourth grade, I lost the fourth grade chess championship. Yeah. And I'm serious about that. Like, it was a fourth, fifth class. It was like 22 kids in the class. 11 were in fourth grade. Eight of them didn't know how to play chess. So there were three of us that did, and I didn't win. And it was a big deal, because this was the first time in my life I was in a situation that was really supposed to be competitive. And I was like, oh yeah, those other eight kids don't even know how to play, I got this. But no, and it was a big deal. And so I was heartbroken, and life goes on, and went on to high school, and. First, one of the first class I take in high school was an acting class, because evidently I have difficulty talking in front of people, which is why I'm a professor now. Um, and, then, and I got a D in the acting class. And I was like, wow, this is really kind of uh, bad, because there's this thing called college I'd like to go to, and they probably don't appreciate letters like this in the alphabet. <laughs> and it was a big deal because it created all kinds of uncertainty about what I thought I could do and what it meant that I might be able to do afterwards. Um, but then, miraculously, somehow I you know, ended up here in college, and the first class I was in was, they still have, was called Freshman English at the time. Now it's power for those of you who are going through it. And I got my first paper, and I got a C. And you know, this was like after, you know, doing better in high school or there were some good grades to get in here. And I was like, wow, I thought I could write, but evidently I can't because I was of that ilk, too, that a C is, is a failing grade. Like, no one told me that, you know, F is actually a failing grade. And at Stanford, we didn't even have Fs then, but it was a C. And so this was this reflection on my character. And I thought, oh, well, if I want to do something afterwards, like graduate school or something like that, well, that's not going to be a possibility. And, and this is a big deal. And uh, I went to graduate school. And one of the things right before graduate school was I applied for this big pr prestigious fellowship and got an interview for the fellowship. And went to the interview. It was up in San Francisco at this hotel. And uh, go into this room, and this person starts asking me these questions. <laughs> at one point, while I'm trying to solve the problem, he just looks at me and he says, did they teach you to do that at Stanford? Like, <laughs> You just like crapped all over this piece of paper. Like, what the hell is that? What kind of like second rate school are you going to? And like, that was a reflection on me because I couldn't solve the problem and I didn't get the fellowship. And that kind of sucked because it sort of meant, well, what does this mean for graduate school? Um, but went to graduate school. During, during graduate school, I won't belabor all the things that happened, but uh, you know, there were a bunch of papers that got rejected at various places, um, which was always kind of fun. But managed to graduate from graduate school and went out on the job market and thought I wanted to be an academic. And there were two places I applied to that were really interesting that I wanted to go to. And one of them was MIT. And 
went there for an interview, met a bunch of interesting people. It was a lovely experience. There were some faculty there who were just amazing, wonderful students. I will probably never admit this again, especially not at MIT. And uh, <laughs> interview happens. I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. Stay in touch with some people there. And uh, get a call from the department chair a couple months later and said, thanks for interviewing, but you're not the candidate we're recommending. And I was like, wow. <laughs> That also sucks, right? Because I spent all this time going to graduate school because I wanted to be a professor. And one of the other places I applied to at the time um, was a research lab in Pittsburgh called Just Research, which was kind of a fun name. It was actually funded by a company in Japan called Just Systems. And I used to think of it as just, like justice, right? So you can convince yourself of anything. Um, <laughs> but went out there for an interview, wonderful group of people, uh, made some actually amazing friends there, some people that I'm still friends with now from this interview in Pittsburgh 20 odd years ago. And uh, wonderful place, really liked it. I was like, oh, I would love to be here, a great place to do research, wonderful <coughs> colleagues. A um, couple weeks later, get a call from them saying, you know, thanks for interviewing. It was nice to have you here, but we can't hire you. And I was, all right, well, you know, we got through all these hoops to get to graduate school, and like, you know, now we're at this place, it's like, you know, what's going on? Um, one of the other things that happened at the time, which was not, you know, there's all these kind of academic failures. One of the things sometimes we feel a little more ashamed to talk about are personal failures. Um, and one of the things that happened when I was in graduate school was I got engaged to someone. So we'd been dating for two years, then we got engaged. And uh, we had like another two years of engagement, and we're planning a big wedding, right? So hundreds of people, the whole like big spiel. Luckily, we had not sent out invitations because four months prior to the wedding, when we were just about to send out invitations, we called the engagement off and broke up. And that also sucked, right? So there was just this, this level of, for lack of a better word, suckage. That was <laughs> um, yeah. Suckage.com, I'm taking that. No one else take that. Um, and uh, it was a really, honestly, it was a dark time. It's probably the, I'd probably say the worst time in my life. Because you look at all these things that were reflections of what you wanted to do, the things you thought you'd accomplished at that point, what you thought about yourself as a person, what other people thought about you as a person, and all these things just start like falling apart. So you're like, well, what am I going to do? Got to go get a job somewhere, right? There was a friend of mine who was actually said, well, we're doing this startup, why don't you come check it out? I'm there, it's okay. Um, Went, spent some time in the industrial world for a while. And one of the things that, that happened along the way that was interesting was uh, when I was trying to make these decisions, there was a friend of mine who said, you know, because I was all like, what am I going to do? What job am I going to take? And he said, you know what? This seems like a big deal. I said, because it is a big deal. And he said, no. It's because you haven't had all the other experiences yet to understand that this is just one step in this process. And I was like, what does that mean? What that means is it was fourth grade. It was the chess championship all over again. And it was the context that I was in, which was, this is where I've gotten to so far, and at this point, I'm facing a failure. What does that mean? Well, what it means is you have a choice. Like, what is this going to mean to you a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now? I look back on those things now, and I'm like, they're kind of funny. They're like the, you know, they're the story I give you now is the slightly more serious version. When I talk to students about it, there's a slightly more humorous version of some of the things that happened, right? There, were, there was a job interview I could tell you about where I drove out. This was on the East Bay. A friend of mine worked at this company. It was this, you know, interesting place back in 1992. Drive out there. The interview's at uh, 8 a.m., Right, which is not a good time for an interview for computer science people, the computer <laughs> science people. Right? So I was, of course, pulling an all-nighter the night before working on some project, and so it's like 6 a.m. I'm like, well, let me just drive out there now. I'll beat traffic, right? So I drive out there, 7 a.m., get to this place in the East Bay, and the interview's in an hour. So I'm in the car. It's a nice, warm, push. <laughs> okay, so I'm like, well, I'll just hang out. I'm going to put the seat back away. <laughs> Next thing I know, my head's jerking up, it's 9.15. No. I run out over to the interview, I'm here all disheveled. I have an interview here at 8 o'clock, I'm really sorry I'm late. They're like, 
well, they're not happy, but they're like, okay, you can go on with the interview. So I'm in this totally sleep deprived, just woke up state, and I hear someone telling me, you have to take this test, and you have to actually write this program, and I hear the word hour and a half, which is actually not one word, but I hear it as hour and a half. <laughs> and so they put me in this room, they gave me this test, I'm sitting here filling out this test, and then there was a computer, and they're like, this is this thing you're supposed to program, they gave me this sheet of stuff you're supposed to program, so I'm sitting there writing, I'm just crying, I'm like, this is ridiculous, like, all this time is passing. And so I crank this thing out, and I, and I come running out of the room at the hour and a half mark, and I'm like, okay, I think I'm done, here it is. And they give me this really weird look, like, why are you coming out? And I was like, because I'm done. And they said, you're done? I'm like, yeah, I'm done. And so I give them this thing, and they give me this weird look, and they take it away. And uh, what I hadn't realized in my sleep-deprived state was they said, you have an hour and a half for the test, and you have an hour and a half for the program. <laughs> I thought I had an hour and a half for the whole thing. So I do a crappy job on all this stuff, give them the thing. They think of me as like, this guy showed up an hour and 15 minutes late for the interview, and now he's not taking this thing seriously, even though he's here. And the friend of mine who set up the interview with the government, he comes over and he's like, let's go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to lunch, we come back, turns out there's a couple other people I meet, which turns out there's fewer than the people I was supposed to meet, because they'd already decided I was not getting hired. So, didn't get that job, but learned an important lesson about not pulling it all night the night before. Um, but even despite that, what ended up happening was there were some other jobs that happened along the way, which happened through sort of some interesting times and, and knowing some... Uh, people and that's one of the things about Stanford that I, I really appreciate and like Ray said the fact that you're here Actually already makes a huge difference right the fact that whether or not you're a student here or a faculty member or staff member or just someone in the community because the connection of people here is amazing and so one of the people who when I was you know went to this first job was someone who was a contact from here someone I actually did projects with when I was in grad school I said, come check out the startup, and I went to the startup. Turned out it worked out pretty well, and then I was going to leave to come back here to teach. And this other friend said, you know, come check out this other thing we're doing. Went there, and turned out that friend's name was Sergey Brin. Turned out he was a pretty good person to know. <laughs> but it happened because of this place. It happened because a whole bunch of people who their plans are to try to make an impact in the world, at least I'd like to think that, all get brought into physical proximity and people say, go. Like, learn what you can learn. Do what you can do. Show us what you can do here and do it together. And you have that here. You have that when you leave. Part of all these things that happen along the way is you realize that all failure does is it, it sort of heightens your sense of uncertainty, right? You have the sense of, like, what you want to do and who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. And when someone says no or some door is closed to you, suddenly that creates uncertainty about what you think you can do, what you think you can accomplish, and, and your view of yourself. And I think part of the, the thing that, that made a difference to me is I'm not different as a person. I wasn't different as a person in fourth grade before or after the chess championship. I wasn't a different person before or after the grant got rejected or approved. But my feelings about my worth as a person were different, even though as a person, I really wasn't any different. And that's the thing, I think, in terms of the, the big takeaway from all of it is, is realizing that uh, there's a lot of it's just expectations you have for yourself and other people's expectations of you. And you can't let those influence what you really want to do. All along the way, after all these failures, the biggest thing that happened was every time I was making a decision, there was this whole series of decisions where like, everyone else around me basically said, like, what are you doing? That's the wrong thing to do. And, I, and, and it's hard when like everyone around you is telling you it's the wrong thing to do. To be honest, when I was at Google and I was coming here, there was a steady stream of people leaving academia going to Google. And at my going away party there, like half the people in the room were former professors. <laughs> and every one of them wanted to take me aside at some point and say like, what are you doing? <laughs> and like by the third one, you're like, no, really, it's okay. I think I know what I'm doing. Right? But it's hard because you're trying to match your expectations every what everyone else wants to think of you. Um, but I think the thing in the end that really made a big difference to me is like, as long as you're still believing like what matters to you, 
right? And you make the decisions that matter to you, and even in spite of those failures. Like, you will do the thing that's right for you. You will do the thing that makes you happy. Um, and just to follow up on Ray's, Ray's point, one final thing, after going through all this stuff with like the grades and the, the chess championship is still, still works now. <laughs> <laughs> the whole point of telling you that was it, it seems ridiculous now, right? All those other things pretty much are ridiculous, right? Because they don't matter anymore. All that matters is kind of where you got. Um, but my kids actually go to a school in Palo Alto, if anyone of you know Ohlone, it has no grades. Because I don't want them to have to deal with that same kind of situation. And they love it. So that's my story. <laughs> there are a couple of questions that I'm going to ask our panelists, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. I know you can ask some questions. What I'd like to just talk about is, what was it like preparing for this experience? Because, you know, you talked about shame, you talked about how big the deals feel, and you're not in the midst of something right now, or at least you're not talking about the things that you're in the midst of right now. But what was it like to prepare for this presentation? Do I have to go first? <laughs> uh, I think it, it, when, you, when you get through things and you're able to look back, and I think it's kind of what Maron was saying too, especially you know, the older you are and the more different kinds of experiences you have, it's just easier to have perspective on things. So I do feel like it's important to talk about that. And for the students that I have, especially the students that work in my lab, we talk about those things all the time. And so I guess I, it, maybe it wasn't that big a deal for me. I feel like it is something that I talk about. I just had a, a student yesterday, actually, who had a grant proposal uh, um, not funded. And uh, she was crushed. And so, you know, you just know that it's something that everybody faces uh, and it's important to, I think, what helps me the most really to deal with things that upset me is, is to talk and bring it out in the open and acknowledge it and, uh, and kind of get rid of that, you know, personal sense of shame. So I think that was why I was excited to come here, and, and in that spirit, I, I feel good about talking about failures, you know? Because they're failures that lead to success, different kinds of success, mm -hmm. things you learn from. <coughs> How was it to prepare for this? Uh, I guess it mostly had, I had to resist two things. One is um, uh, giving you cheap advice, you know? Mm -hmm. Get kicked down the stairs, get up. Um, uh, yeah, that's not a problem around here. Everybody here tries too hard already. And people try so hard, they hit, that's why they fall down the stairs, think somebody kicked them. Um, so that, that was one temptation. And the other was to just tell you that um, had nothing to do with me. None of this stuff is any, all the stories I told you is, I'm not, my biography is borrowed from American culture, which has a lot of nasty dimensions. And it's, you know, it's home, it's what I love. I cry at the Star Spangled Banner, wherever I am. Um, and, you know, basketball games and, and whatever. I don't know why. Um, I was a Cub Scout once, and might, might have something to do with it. I, I, I quit that because I, I didn't think it was serious enough. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to come and say, um, the second kind of advice that is to say it really does have nothing to do with it. It's just you keep getting set up for this stuff, and if you believe it, and you, and you take it to be a measure of yourself, you're making a terrible mistake. So I think I said both those, those things, but I'll try not to say them. And, um, and, and just to resist the, the uh, Reader's Digest version of psychology, that, um, you know, they make their living on all of us feeling badly because um, well, we're doing what um, we think it's about us that we're living the life we're living. 
But if you feel that way, then go get another life. I think that's a real good idea. One of my attractions to anthropology is that I got to live in other places. I lived in Japan a year and a half. And, and every, every time I go, go out the door, I see it can be real different. They worry about things I don't. I worry about things they don't. That's, that's a real important, good message. Um, so after I put all that stuff aside, then there was nothing left to do to tell you about, about my failures. And uh, so I hope you enjoyed them. <laughs> well, the people who succeeded as a result thought they were real good. <laughs> well, I think it was, part of it was just the feel. I remember the feeling of being a student, and especially at a place like this where you're surrounded by all these really accomplished people, right? Where it's always it's the success bio, it's not the failure bio you ever see, right? And that's just plastered all over the place. Um, that's even more true as a faculty <coughs> member. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> How many Nobel Prize winners are there? <laughs> How many Nobel Prize losers are there? Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot more, but they don't talk about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then they lost the Nobel Prize in 1996. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that'd be pretty cool just to be nominated and lose, right? I'm not even at the point where I can lose the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think it was just that feeling and being able to share that, like, you know, when you're around all these people, it seems like they have it together, and it's like, oh, everything just kind of works out. It's like, no, it doesn't, and that's normal. I have questions, but I, I think you probably have much more interesting questions than I do, so why don't we turn it to our audience, and what are your questions for our or, or failure stories. Or failure stories, if you're interested in just sharing your own. Uh, nobody failed. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm kind of curious about, I feel like there's like this idea of failure that's just a temporary setback. And so like when you first be here to go on and succeed and like do the thing that maybe you end up failing at. Um, <coughs> what if you really just are mediocre? Like what if you just are, like it's kind of like, I, I mean of course you're going to succeed at other things later on, but what if you kind of, there, you know? Maybe maybe it's a process of learning about yourself also. So, I mean, one thing we didn't really talk about was what's the alternative to failure? And I think the alternative to failure is to never really put yourself out there or try something or, you know, really put all your all into something because you don't want to be in that position of maybe failing. And that's the failure. Right? You're, you're going to learn. You're going to learn something new about yourself. And if you try really hard to do something and it doesn't work out or you, you don't enjoy it or, you know, you've learned a valuable piece of information just as valuable as finding something that you spend all your time on that you do love. I think part of it too is the you know, what makes you think you're mediocre and at what, right? So I remember thinking there were things like I was mediocre at too and that maybe, and there were some things that, you know, you have to give up at some point. Like Ray remembers when I had long hair and there was a time I wanted to <laughs> play guitar and I had metal band. That didn't happen. Um, I remember the chest hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you knew about the chest hair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but there are some things where you can look at and you can say, okay, this is not going to work out the way I thought. What are the other things that, where are the other directions I can go, or how can things be different? Um, there's a lot of people, you know, who end up accomplishing a lot of things that have a big impact in the world, which are not the things they originally set out to do. Um, and it's because they, they spent the time to find out what were the other things, or is there another route to be able to make the kind of impact they want to have. Genius is one of the junk ideas uh, of our society. Um, it, you know, it's an old uh, Latin word for uh, you have a genius would be like a spirit, a guardian spirit, would go around with you. In the Middle Ages, it was a person who was uh, given a gift by God, and it wasn't had nothing to do with that person. He just momentarily created something with that gift, and then the gift was gone, and everything went back to it. 
Um, that it went back to the way it was, except that there's this extra thing sitting there, but it's not the person who's a genius. Um, then around 1700, in English, the first essay on the genius of the kind of person, um, 1711, which is one year after the copyright law gets passed, and suddenly you could sell your genius. Mm. Then uh, there was a lot of competition for it. We had 150 years of people neurotically worrying about their genius, Joyce, mm. Nietzsche, and everybody upset. And now you have to call the genius to get a job and, uh, <laughs> at a university, and it's truly crazy. And I know thousands of professors. I got three or four people who like seem to process stuff so differently. I can't believe how how fast it is, but. Everybody else is as mediocre as can be. Um, I mean, there are, I'm so me in Chinese, but I, there are people who learn languages like they drink water. They're usually not very good at talking to people, but they can do it in 20 languages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, do we want to call them a genius? Nah, what are they doing with it, you know? Um, uh, and there are people here in music, and um, I, love, I love jazz. So only this month comes down off the stage one night, in 1958, he was very unhappy, and he said, what's wrong, man? And he said, oh, tonight I played all the wrong mistakes. And so I went and investigated it. It's really fascinating. Monk would practice 10 hours a day, and he'd take one song, and he'd play it, you know, a thousand times. And then, but, and then he'd start building mistakes in at different places, and his job was to take that mistake and make sure if you were listening to it, two seconds after you heard that mistake, you wouldn't be able to get back to it he would make that mistake into the first note of a new pattern which he would play on top of the pattern he was already playing. Wow, okay, that is the way it is supposed to be. That's the way, that's the way the great athletes do it, that's the way language learners, not me, seem to do it. Um, but genius, it's just a way to alienate people. It's a way to make people feel bad they don't have it. It's like the American economy, and goes beautifully. It's a beautiful cap idea of capitalism, it's perfectly done. The Japanese, on the other hand, one of the best books in Japanese culture is called The Nobility of Failure. You know, people who just do everything wrong, they get all their soldiers killed, they get killed, and people worship them because they were so uh, genuine and, and uh, pure in their effort that they continue going all the way to failure. I mean, not like, you know, you didn't get a job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah. So, at what point, or how, what, say you're, you know, you're trying really hard at something, you're trying to purify the process, <laughs> um, at what point do you decide you know, it's time to move on. Like, I could keep trying, but you know, like, you don't want to give up immediately, but you don't want to waste, you know, decades of your life on a seemingly futile task. And so what kind of considerations do you bring in to a decision like that? When you have, like, a big... I, know, think, I think that's the hardest skill to learn. I, I don't know if there is a really good answer to that question. Do you guys have a good answer to that question? Until you don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> That's basically until I can just had it. That's when you stop. And I think you don't make the decision alone. I think you talk about what the experience is like and what the frustration is about and you let other people weigh in. You know, one thing that's been helpful is the notion of saying no to something or stopping something. You can think of it as a failure itself. I Google, there used to be parties when a project got canceled or failed. Not always, but sometimes. And you might say, that's, that's crazy. Like, why would you have a party for failure? And the idea was, if we've tried to do this thing and we realized we can't do it, it's good that we've realized this now rather than wasting another five years. So let's celebrate the fact that we realized that and because what now that gives us is an opportunity for all these people who were working on this problem to go find a new problem to work on. And that's, you know, there's this book that's about the, you know, the power of the positive no, which a friend of mine told me I should read, and I didn't read it, but I read the synopsis on it. <laughs> I feel like I can now talk about it. 
And the idea is basically simply that when you say no to something or you stop something, don't think of that as a failure. Think of it as an opportunity that you have time to say yes to something else. And that at least helps you take some positivity away from it so you can do the next thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming and speaking. Um, how would you recommend setting expectations and then checking in on the progress for our results? Set expectations high. Why wouldn't you? But uh, I think you also have to be prepared to, uh, if you set those expectations high, you know, you have to be prepared to not meet them. Is that a failure? I mean, if you have made progress beyond where you started, that's not really failure. I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but you know, I, I think setting low expectations is, because I, I experienced that also, I think when I was young especially, uh, I, I, I was more afraid and set low expectations. And I just, I just think that's, uh, you have more to lose from that than setting your expectations high. And then perhaps disappointing yourself. But again, maybe in that process of disappointment, maybe you are learning how to better calibrate your expectations next time. I don't know. There's some things in life that you just have to go through and they're not, easy and they're not fun, but if you don't go through them, you know, you don't learn. I think we have time for one last question back there. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, you guys have done like a great job of like distinctively recognizing failure, but on the other hand, um, how would you guys define success? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Falsely. And Okay, so I was rooting for the Cubs. I see that success. <laughs> and, you know, every time Curry takes a shot, I, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, but they're not really successes. I mean, it's, it's a made-up game. And, you know, it's good for the political economy in Chicago, I guess, this year. And they could use it. Um, but, I, you know, it's, it's not real. And... Most of the successes I've had have been a total surprise, and they turn out to be all that real. I've never set expectations. Every, um, since I was bailing out of Queen's College 50 years ago, I really didn't expect anything. Um, and it's really okay, because I've had a lot of friends, and, and, and I share work with a lot of friends. I'm married to, to a colleague. Um, and you know, they just periodically say, don't do that anymore. Or my, my, one of my closest friends, when I was, I said, I was very, dis, very disappointed. I said, I'm, I'm not going to take Chinese anymore. I said, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> you were killing yourself on this thing. And it, it, was, it was like watching a person you know, hang, bang their head against the wall. Actually, it was more like, if you ever poured water over a rock, that's what learning a language is for me. I, I get wet, <laughs> and then it all dries up. By the time I get to the end of the classroom door, it's gone. All right, so um, expectations just seem like a uh, too, too easy way to beat yourself up and to beat up others. But I mean, I work like a crazy person. But it's, it's pure lust for ideas. I love ideas. I never, I don't care what I'm eating almost. Um, and I, you know, I go off, I quit, I ain't going to do American education for another day. And I go off, I read Irish literature for a year. And you know, I'm writing a paper on you know, what Joyce says, to ha what the message of James Joyce is for American education. <laughs> and it just always sneaks back in, I can't escape it. I didn't make a decision to do that. I made a decision to get the hell out of there. And then, fine, I pray for that. It's kind of fun. And yeah, I'd say that, you know, like there's, Things you put on your resume, and like, at an earlier age, I would have considered those successes, like, oh, this accomplishment or this award or whatever. Um, and to be honest, those aren't interesting anymore. Um, in some like, like deep way. And so, what I consider a success is like, when I go home, am I just feeling happy? 
And there's a lot of days where it's like nothing special happened, but that day was a success because I feel really happy. And there's other days where it's like you got some emails like, congratulations, blah, 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 you won the Nigerian lottery, or you know, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> you <too. laughs> well, we split the price. Um, but you know, there you get some accomplishment or whatever. And, and part of the realization was that accomplishment that you get or whatever is a post facto recognition of things you were doing that you cared about. And if the things you were doing that you cared about were things that made you happy and you felt like you were making a difference, that was the success. And the fact that someone a year later recognized it or something, it was like, okay, thanks, that's nice. But that's not what's making me feel good about it. What's making me feel good about it is like, you know, more kids are learning computer science or whatever. Well, I want to thank our panelists again so much for